Well, it's pr quite a privilege for my wife and I to be here with you today. Uh, we were here two years ago, so this is my second time here. I, I recognize some faces. Yesterday, um, I got to help Marty and Donald uh, pick up some food from the food pantry. I believe I worked with Lynn and Linda, um, Ron. I recognize a few faces here. so. Um, even though I'm slow with names, I, I think I'm going to learn more and more of your names. Amen. I have to share something too. When we were here two years ago, I remember an individual that met us at the door and greeted us so kindly. Um, and her kind greeting and cheerful attitude has stuck with me for two years. And it was Rosa. Yes. Rosa, I don't think you realize what an impact you have when you're so kind and thoughtful toward people. As I was getting prepared to pack a suit to have the sermon today, in the Michigan winter tradition, I packed a, a black suit and um, a golden tie and a black shirt. And my wife informed me that that was not what you wear in Florida. So she repacked, and now you see what uh, what she has chosen for me. Yes. There's a few things that I would like to introduce before I have a prayer. Some of the goals that I'm going to have today, I want to talk about why the Old Covenant failed. I want to talk about, is the moral law, the character of God, still binding? And I want to talk about the New Covenant, because there's some confusion there. I'm probably not going to be teaching you something all that new. I may just be redefining the lines. In... Ecclesiastes 7.20, we see that it says, There is not a righteous man that is doing good that is not sinning. So we, we see that we, we needed something more. I'm going to talk about that today. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, first off, we come thanking you and praising you for all that you do in our lives. We realize that we're totally dependent upon you, that if left to ourselves, we would make poor decisions, and even when we try to serve and honor you to the best of our ability, we would come up short. But you have promised to lead us, to guide us, and to be there for us if we will only surrender our will to you. Father, we pray now for the presence of the Holy Spirit, that you may speak through your word, and speak truth to us today. Father, we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. I would like first for you to turn with me to Colossians 2 and verse 14. seems to be some confusion sometimes when this is read and it's used to determine that God's character, the moral law, has been done away with. So I want to start there, maybe redefine the lines a little bit. Looking at verse 14, it says, Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. The first thought that I want to mention is, it may have been taken out of the way, but it wasn't done away with. Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross too, and he was not done away with. Even if the God's moral law had been nailed to the cross, 
it would have been fulfilled in a new way, just as his life was fulfilled in a new way, the ceremonial law was fulfilled in a new way, it was simply a shadow of Jesus to come. So even if they had been nailed to a cross, it would have not changed. But I want to look at this further and see what was actually nailed to the cross. Looking on down, and if you read this in context, it becomes clear as to what's being talked about. As we look on down, we see so um, in verse 16, So let no one judge you in food or in drink, or in regarding a festival or new moons or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of the things to come, but the substances of Jesus. We can almost get the idea that it's talking about the ceremonial law here. The things to come, the shadow to come, all the ceremonial laws, the sanctuary services, were to point forward to Jesus. Amen. They were the schoolmaster to bring us to Jesus Christ. We know that it wasn't talking about the moral law, but I want to... And you know, another thing to keep in mind as we're thinking about this, keep in the, this in the back of your mind. The moral law of God was written in stone with the finger of God and placed inside the ark. The ceremonial law was written by man in a book and placed outside the ark. We were given plenty of opportunity to understand the differences between these two laws. One was temporary, one was permanent. Even today we would say, well, it's written in stone. That means you can bank on it. It's permanent. In fact, where did we probably get that saying from? I'd like to look at the anatomy because we're talking about the covenants. And a covenant is simply a contract. So I may even call it a covenant contract because that's what this was. But I would like to look at the anatomy of a contract for a moment because I want to come from another perspective. Even if you weren't convinced that God's moral law was still intact and that it was talking about the ceremonial law, I want to come from a new perspective that you might see this from a different way and see that it also agrees with that thinking. The anatomy of a contract today has three pieces to make it a contract. So it's going to be important that you follow me here for just for a moment so that this will make sense to you. A contract has to have terms for the contract. These terms would be details of performance such as provisions that are offered for acceptance and determine the nature and scope of the agreement. So why are we drawing up a contract? Um, and these are what are going to define the outline of this contract. You might say in this contract that time of completion, say that we're on a project. If I was a contractor, for example, time of completion may be in there. Payment schedule may be in there. Even goodwill may be written in there, stating that I'm not just going to do the basic bare minimum to finish this project, but I'm going to sweep the floors, I'm going to do it with a cheerful attitude, and I'm going to add as much goodwill to this as I possibly can. That may be even written in the contract as part of the terms of the contract, how it's going to take place. Okay, the second part of a contract is the articles of the contract. Um, from Webster's Dictionary, we can read this. It's a distinct, often numbered section or writing, a separate clause, a composition forming an independent part, and stands alone, and is the basis for the contract. So the articles of the contract are the really important thing. If we don't have articles, we don't need a contract. The third thing needed in a contract would be a signature by both parties agreeing. So we're going to ratify or confirm this contract with our signatures. It's been written out. Here's all the terms of the contract. Here are the articles of the contract. And 
we're going to, yep, we both agree we're going to sign it. I want to go back to Mount Sinai for a moment and read the original contract drawn up and some of the details in it. So we're going to turn to Exodus chapter 24. Exodus 24, and I think I'd like to start in verse 3. We're going to go down through this and we're going to see if we can find these three portions of this contract. Verse 3, 24 and verse 3. So Moses came and told all the people the words of the Lord and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words of the Lord has said, we will do. So they were agreeing to this contract. God had asked them for something. They said, we agree. Reading on in verse 4. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes. Now this is the contract that he's drawing up. Remember, the Ten Commandments were written with the finger of God in stone. But he's drawn up this contract. Then he sent, uh, verse 5, Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrifices, peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. Verse 6, And Moses took half of the blood and put it in a basin, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Now we're going to see in a moment where the the blood in the basin went. So we see that it has two parts now. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. What we're seeing here now are the terms of the contract. He's asking us to have his character be like him, and we've said, okay, we agree, we'll do that. These are the terms of this contract being drawn up. Looking on down to verse 8. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. This was the other blood that was in the basin. And said, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. So now we see... Both parties have signed the contract with blood. You might ask yourself, why did they sign with blood? Why wouldn't they just put an X or sign a name or whatever? Why blood? Why would they ratify the covenant with blood? I think I heard somebody. Life is in the blood. The life is in the blood. Very good. So in that day, if you were to... And that has more than one meaning for sure. But in that day, if you were to make an agreement, make a contract or a covenant, you're basically saying, by signing with blood, you're saying, by my life, I will keep this. You know, today I think we enter into agreement so easily. We sign our name off on something. Maybe even had good intentions of keeping it, but easily such as in a marriage vow or whatever, we find ourselves maybe reneging. If we, if we thought we were going to die when we didn't keep that agreement, we probably would think differently. So I'm going to read on. I'm in verse 9. Then Moses went up also, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the seventy elders of Israel. I'm going to actually skip down to verse 12. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tables of stone and the law and the commandment which I have written, that you may teach them. Now we've just received the articles of the contract. So we see that it's complete. We have the terms and scope. We have the articles, and we have the two signatures making this a complete contract. 
And actually, I want to um, I want to flip over now to Exodus 32. Just a few pages over. Exodus 32 and verse 7. Starting in verse 7. And the Lord said to Moses, Go get down from your people whom you brought out of the land of Israel, for they have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves molten calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is our God, O Israel, that brought us out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. In today's terms, what would we call this? It's stubborn, stubborn. It was a breach of contract. And of all the things you said as well. <laughs> so we see that there's been a breach of contract. The first covenant was broken. The contract was broken. Null and void. I'd like to use an analogy to help you to understand where, where we're at in this. Maybe something more modern day. Say, for example, I'm going to try to pick on somebody. Um, I'll pick on Marty because I think I can easily do that in a little bit. <laughs> Say that Marty decided to build a new home. Picked out a piece of property, found a new home, and determined what he wanted built on it. Found some blueprints for exactly the design of home he wanted, maybe like a, um, a nice uh, tan color or a kind of a top or a clay color, and, and he said, I would like it to be stuccoed, um, just a single story with a hip roof, um, and kind of explained out and actually had blueprints for this home, the floor plan print and everything. And he approached me and said, you know, Mike, you're a contractor. I would like to hire you to build me this home. And so we entered into a contract. In this contract, the terms and scope of the contract would certainly be payment schedules, time of completion, uh, the goodwill that we talked about, or any other thing that we felt important to put in this contract. There may be other provisions, and we don't know what they all might be. So those would be the terms and the scope. The articles of the contract would certainly be the blueprint, right? This is the reason we're drawing a contract. I want this home. This is it right here. The only thing left for us to do now, once we've drawn this all up, is both of us sign the contract. So say we sign the contract, and we're ready to start. Marty's made his first down payment. I've ordered some materials. They showed up on the job site. A week has gone by, and nothing has happened. About halfway through the second week, when I told him I would already be there, nothing's still happening. So Marty says, hey, how are we coming on that? I've seen some materials arrive. Um, doesn't seem like anything's happening. So as we find out, even though I'm a contractor, it becomes evident that I don't have a license to operate. Therefore, I cannot pull a building permit. Let's say that Marty at some point had had some experience. And of course, being a homeowner, he can pull his own permit without a contract or license. He doesn't have to be licensed to pull a permit. I, on the other hand, doing work for him would have to pull one. So he finds out that I'm not I'm able to build the house, but I don't have a license, and I can't pull up from the end, so I can't do what I said I was going to do. So we have a breach of contract. But Marty says, listen, I have some ability to build the house. I can pull the permit. I know that you have ability to build the house. Let's drop a new contract 
and let's work together and build this house. Because I need some of your expertise. I'm able to get the part done you can't do. We're going to work together and we're going to build this house. So we do. We, because of the breach of the original contract, we draw up a new contract made upon better promise. This contract is going to be able to be kept and fulfilled. Looking back at the Bible, now we're going to see how God dealt with this. So I want to turn to Hebrews chapter 8. Because he is actually able to fulfill the promise. Our, our hearts may have been willing, but our flesh was weak. God was not caught off guard by this, and he was not surprised by it. He had plans, even from the foundation of the world, how to deal with this. So this is the question that now remains. In the, the original contract, what happened to the articles in the Bible? What would happen to the articles? What happened to the articles with Marty and I building a house? Unchanged. Still wants this house built? Has the dimensions, the color, the, the size, the shape, all the details still all there intact? It's going to pass into the new contract, correct? Mm -hmm. What changed in the contract? Terms. The terms and the scope of the contract. In this contract, we see now that Jesus is able to fulfill it. I want to read through a little more details of this. I'm going to continue reading. Verse 7. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant, that I made with their fathers in that day when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I, I, and you gotta re I want you to realize how many eyes are here and it's God speaking. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. It's quite clear to me, and evident to me here, that he's saying, I am going to perform this. Does he need our cooperation to be able to do it? Certainly. You know, it makes me think of the text in Philippians 2.13, which says, It's God who works in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. So what is our part in this? 
It's not to exercise the will, it's to surrender the will. We cannot be trusted with our wills. Our hearts are deceitful above all things who can know them. We had good intentions and maybe and come up short. I want to say this morning, I want to give a little clearer look at the second covenant. I want to look at the signatures. In the second covenant, we outline the anatomy of the covenant. It's very clear we understand what it is. Where is our signature on the second contract? We know where Jesus was. It was by the blood, right? When did he ratify the new covenant? It was on the cross, right? Where is our signature in this contract? Ellen White uses the term proffered gift. Proffered means proposed. In the second contract, Jesus said, I'm going to come and die for you to fulfill the terms of the contract, even if you're not willing. And the choice is simply yours. When do we sign this contract? When we come to a point where we're willing to surrender our will. And we say, yes, I believe in you. By faith, I want to receive righteousness. I believe in you. And here is my will. Maybe a daily surrender, maybe a momentary surrender. But it's still at that point is when we sign the contract. And he says, it's binding. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep my end. Jesus has signed with his lifeblood. So now, the terms and the scope will be carried out through the person of Jesus Christ, and it's going to be perfection through surrender. Really, spending time abiding. I'd like to give you a couple more examples before we close. I'd like to look, take a look at Luke 23. In the words of Jesus, Luke 23, And verse 54. Actually, I'm going to back up. Um, I want to add something else in here. But no, let's look at that while we're there. Actually, I'm going to... So I want to take a look at this for a minute. And I want to dissect this. See what we're seeing here. 23 and 54. We know that this is Jesus going to the cross when he was going to die, sign the contract. Then the day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. What do we know the preparation day to be? Friday. Okay. We would know that to be Friday or the day before the Sabbath, correct? And the women, I'm, I'm in verse 55, and the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after. And they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Now on the first day of the week, 